The topic of today's talk is the cultivation of virtue and the telos of education. Before we can really begin digging into this topic, I want to start by laying out a few basic definitions and grounding assumptions. First of all, the Greek word telos means goal or purpose or end, the goal toward which something is directed. I cannot underestimate the importance of the fact that every model of education, whether it's secular or religious, progressive or classical, whatever, every model of education has, whether it admits it or not, whether it's implicit or explicit, a telos. That is to say, every model of education has a goal a vision of the good life that it is attempting to pass on to its students. Or to put it another way, every model of education is based on a set of values. There is no such thing as a values-free or values-neutral education. Every system of education is based on and inculcates certain values into its students. And this truth has been recognized throughout history, from ancients to moderns, from pagans to Christians to atheists, basically everybody. Let me just give you one example. The 20th century philosopher Bertrand Russell writes in his book, On Education, we must have some concept of the kind of person we wish to produce before we can have any definite opinion as to the education which we consider best. Think about that. Before we can figure out what kind of education we want to put together, we have to know where it's going. What kind of person is it trying to produce? And so the question is, what should our goal or what should the telos of education be? Now, there are two problems with most contemporary discourse about education. The first is that contemporary dialogue about education typically avoids discussion of telos altogether. There's just really not much talk about the purpose of education out there. The emphasis in educational research and policy development is overwhelmingly on the how of education and the why is almost completely overlooked. So we get things like how to raise test scores, how to increase graduation rates, how to help students with educational challenges, how to train teachers to use technology, etc. And there are unfortunately a plethora of teachers, administrators, and even educational theorists around our country who would be hard pressed to give a clear definition of what the purpose of education is at all. That's tragic because it means that as a society we are working hard to make sure that our educational train is running efficiently without seriously asking where that train ought to be going. Consider a metaphor used by David Hicks in his book, Norms and Nobility. He writes, both policymaker as strategist and school administrator as educator resemble the farmer who tries to plow a field with his eyes on the plow rather than on that imaginary point on the horizon on which he must fix his gaze if he expects to leave a straight furrow. Uh, when I was learning how to drive, I remember uh, one of the first lessons I learned is that if you want to drive down the middle of the road, you can't look right over the hood, right? I, would, I, would, I started sort of looking right over the hood of the car and trying to drive to stay in the middle. And my dad said, no, 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 you have to look up, look, look down the road. And I said, but I got to stay on the road right here. And he said, no, no, but when you look down the road, it, what you're doing right here will work itself out. Okay? And David Hicks is, ma is making the same point with, with his metaphor of the plow. If we want our educational system to take us in the right direction, we've got to lift up our eyes away from just the, how do I create a lesson plan? How should we do assessment? How, 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 how? And ask the question of, where are we trying to go? What, what is our goal? What is the direction uh, toward which we are aiming? So the first step of the problem is that we don't talk enough about the goals of education. The second step of the problem is that when we do talk about education's goals, we often, unfortunately, have them all wrong. In the 21st century, most people simply assume that the primary purpose of education, if not its only purpose, is to equip students with the knowledge and technical skills that they will need in order to go out into the world and be successful. And generally, if you push hard enough on what do you mean by successful, you get something that's reducible to pecuniary plenitude. In other words, uh, to be rich. The idea is, uh, to put it baldly, education is a means toward the end of making money. 
Thus, when you ask the question, for example, uh, why is K-12 education important? You get an answer like, well, it's important to have a good education so you can get into a good college. You say, well, why is that important? Well, you have to get into a good college so you can get into grad school. Why is that important? Well, so that you can get a good job. Well, who cares? Who wants a good job? Well, so that you can make a good living, you know, and, and have a good, happy, successful life. Now, note a couple things about that chain of reasoning. First of all, education is merely instrumental. On that line of thinking, there's nothing good in, it, in and of itself about education. It's merely a means to an end. It's not an end in and of itself. And note also that there is a, a telos in mind. I said all education is directed towards some telos. There is a telos or goal here. The purpose of education is ultimately to make money. William Dreskowitz describes our situation thus. We talk about national competitiveness, the 21st century labor force, technology and engineering, and the outlook of our future prosperity. But we never talk about the premises that underlie this conversation as if what makes for a happy life and a good society were simply self-evident. And, as if in either case, the exclusive answer were more money. Unfortunately, this is how many people in our contemporary society think about education. I have heard international leaders in education give talks about education in which the closest thing to any sort of teleological claim was something insipid like, well, school prepares students for college and career. In Sir Richard Livingston's 1944 Reed Lecture, he summed up this illiberal approach to education in a way that I think trenchantly depicts our current educational milieu as well. He said this, It is characteristic of today that when we discuss which subjects should be studied or which languages should be learnt, the first consideration is nearly always utility. We ask what is most useful for the machine, not what is most likely to make a good human being. At times, the right motto for our education seems to be propter vitam vivendi perdere causas, that is, for the sake of livelihood to lose what makes life worth living. The material in life tends to dominate, spiritual and moral life is forgotten, wisdom and even judgment recede into the background. In a 1975 essay titled A Remarkable Man, Wendell Berry similarly writes that we think it ordinary to spend 12 or 16 or 20 years of a person's life and many thousands of public dollars on education and not a dime or a thought on character. There are many people, however, who don't bat an eye at the notion that the basic purpose of education is to teach job skills so that people can go out and find jobs and make money. And even a cursory examination of, of statements by public politicians, our presidents, governments, uh, governors, federal, state educational policymakers, demonstrates that our leaders often view the importance of our country's educational system primarily in economic terms. The goal of education, it would seem, is to prepare people for jobs so that they can have a successful career and contribute to our economy. Now, there are two basic problems with this view. The first is that it's just plain dumb, and the second is that it runs contrary to thousands of years of profound educational thought. And if you think that just plain dumb doesn't sound very sophisticated or nuanced, you could substitute this. It is philosophically, theologically, and functionally anemic. In other words, it's just plain dumb. It doesn't make sense conceptually. It doesn't work practically. So what I'd like to do in the rest of our time today is to paint a picture of a much more robust understanding of the telos of education that has the cultivation of virtue at its center. And I hope that you walk away from this talk convinced of two things. Uh, first, I hope that you're convinced that we ought to hold the cultivation of virtue to be a central goal of education. And second, I hope that you walk away being convinced that this indeed has been the standard understanding of education for centuries, and that contemporary views of education that neglect the centrality of virtue are historical anomalies. Now, there's no way in our short time uh, together today I can cover the central role that virtue has played throughout the entirety of the history of educational philosophy. 
So instead, what I'm going to do is first focus on the Greek philosopher Plato, who is both the founder of the Western philosophical tradition and also widely considered to be the father of philosophy of education as a discipline. As the 20th century philosopher Alfred North White had famously quipped, the safest general characterization of the European philosophical tradition is that it consists of a series of footnotes to Plato. In other words, Plato wrote about all the big questions, he wrote about all the big ideas, and for the last over 2,000 years since then, we've just been adding footnotes to what he wrote. Okay. Maybe a bit hyperbolic, but the point is, he's a central figure in this tradition. So if we're going to focus on one thinker whose thought has shaped the last couple thousand of years, of education in the West, it makes sense to focus on Plato. And then after examining Plato's thought in some depth, I will close by offering, offering a rapid fire sequence of other thinkers' statements about the role of virtue in education to show that there is in fact a long tradition of thinkers who are basically in agreement about virtue's centrality in education. Plato, who lived from 427 to 347 BC, clearly understands education to be fundamentally teleological. In other words, he recognizes that all education, again, whether explicitly or implicitly, has a goal or goals toward which it is directed. Furthermore, according to Plato, the primary and ultimate goal of education is to form people who are virtuous. The primary purpose of education is not to transfer to students a body of knowledge. The primary purpose of education is not to teach practical technical skills. The primary purpose of education is not to prepare students for a specialized vocation. Rather, the primary purpose of education is to cultivate students into virtuous human beings who are equipped to live well. Now, I want to pause for a second and just unpack this word virtue and what we mean by this. The Greek word for virtue, arete, is broader in meaning than the English word virtue. Arete is an interesting word that's usually translated virtue or excellence. And while the word does have moral overtones, it's not an exclusively moral term. Rather, it refers to the capability of a thing to fulfill its purpose or nature. So, for example, a knife can be virtuous insofar as it is able to cut well, that is to say, fulfill its purpose as a knife and function according to its nature. A cow could be excellent or virtuous insofar as it is capable of producing milk, that is to say, of fulfilling its purpose as a cow. So similarly, the virtue of a person is the quality that enables a person to fulfill his purpose and live according to his true nature. For what it's worth, the Latin word virtus, from which we get our word in English, virtue, also has a broader meaning. The Latin word virtus comes from the Latin vird, which means man. So etymologically, virtue means something like manliness, and to be virtuous is to be manly. Now, we shouldn't think of that in any sort of macho sense, right? The idea is rather that to be virtuous is to be an actualized human being, a person who lives with excellence and thus embodies all that human beings were made to be. Thus, Joseph Pieper claims in his preface to the four cardinal virtues that these four virtues can enable man to attain the furthest potentialities of nature. This isn't just moralism. When we talk about forming virtuous people, we're not just talking about people who do the right things. Right? They don't cheat on their taxes, they don't lie, etc. That's part of it, but it's something broader. We're talking about forming people of arete, of virtue or excellence, who are enabled to fulfill their purpose and live according to their true nature, who can be all that they were made to be. Above all else, the truth for which Plato searched was truth about the nature of virtue. If you read his dialogues, it, it's really remarkable that all throughout them, uh, Soc Socrates is continually conversing with different interlocutors to figure out the, the nature of different virtues. So in the Euthyphro, it's piety. Uh, in the Republic, it's justice. There, there are others. In the Mino, it's the, it's the nature of virtue itself. Okay? Plato lived in a context in Athens in which the sophists had convinced many Athenians that the measure of educational success was one's ability to win an argument, convince a jury, or please an audience. They used rhetoric, 
And their message was that the education they offered was valuable, was worth what it cost, because it could make students successful. If you come to us, we will train you how to go into the court and win. Plato's critique of this view, as relevant today as it was over 2,400 years ago, is that utilitarian ends such as these are paltry substitutes for the true telos of education. The purpose of education is the formation of human beings who are good. Throughout his works, Plato is explicit that the purpose of education is to form people who are virtuous or good. In the Republic, for example, he writes that the final outcome of education, I suppose we'd say, is a single newly finished person who is either good or the opposite. Note what, he, what he's not saying there. He's not saying you can judge whether an education was well done or not on whether a, the, the student gets into college or whether they go out and get a job or whether they make a lot of money or whether they have lots of friends. No, he says what, what determines whether the education they received worked or not is whether that person is good. That's the key question. He goes on to argue that the form of the good is the most important thing to learn about and that it's by their relation to it, the good, that just things and others become useful and beneficial. In the laws, he similarly explains that what he means by education is not training for a particular trade or business, but education from childhood in virtue. And he goes on to explain that this virtue consists in having one's loves properly aligned, such that one adores what is good and abhors what is not. He writes, There is one element you could isolate in any account you give of education, and this is the correct formation of our feelings of pleasure and pain, which makes us hate what we ought to hate from first to last and love what we ought to love. Call this education, and I, at any rate, think that you would be giving it its proper name. Thus, in contrast to the sophists, whose primary goal was to equip students with practical skills that they could go out into the world and use to be successful in Athenian society, for Plato, the ultimate goal of education is right conduct, not success, as society defines it. This understanding of the goal of education significantly affects how Plato understands the value and purpose of various curricular subjects. And he's explicit that the subjects he thinks ought to be studied should be studied not because of their content per se, but rather because of their ability to turn the soul away from darkness and toward goodness and truth. He admonishes that each of us must neglect all other subjects and be most concerned to seek out and learn those that will enable him to distinguish the good life from the bad and always to make the best choice possible in every situation. So Plato recognizes that the various subjects in the curriculum are not ends in and of themselves. Rather, they're educationally valuable only insofar as they promote the realization of education's ultimate goals. That is, the formation of virtue. I'd like to just briefly point out as an example of this, the rationale that Plato gives for the four subjects that later came to be known as the quadrivium, arithmetic, geometry, what we call music, he calls harmonics, and astronomy. Um, the, 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 the four subjects of the quadrivium are part of the liberal arts. Uh, the trivium is the other three of the traditional seven liberal arts, so the traditional uh, trivium is grammar, dialectic, and rhetoric, and then again the quadrivium, arithmetic, geometry, music, and astronomy. Those are the traditional uh, seven liberal arts. And in the Republic, Plato gives a, a rationale for why certain subjects should be studied, and he covers the four subjects of the quadrivium. And I, I want to point this out because sometimes within classical education circles, um, there's this idea that the math and science courses are a little bit less a part of the liberal arts, right? Literature and history, we say, nurture our humanity and our character. We get that. They help us to become virtuous. But math and science are technical. They're not liberal arts. They just help us do stuff, build bridges and figure out which size of a jar of salsa in the, in the grocery store is a better value, etc. Okay. Plato, however, disagreed, and his rationale gives us insight into the true purpose of all areas of study. So, briefly, arithmetic. A lot of people don't understand why studying math is important. 
And you know, the students say, why do we have to learn this? When are we ever going to use this? And then teachers try to come up with you know, various reasons. Well, you, maybe you'll go into a field where you need it. Or, well, you know, wouldn't it be nice if you could figure out whether the six ounce jar or the nine ounce jar is a better value at the grocery store, whatever, okay? Um, Plato, though, argues that arithmetic is val valuable not because it enables us to carry out business, but because it leads us toward truth and the ability to grasp being. He argues that the true purpose of education in arithmetic is not, and I'm quoting here, like tradesmen and retailers for the sake of buying and selling, but rather for ease in turning the soul around, away from becoming and toward truth and being. Have you ever heard that explanation given to eighth graders for why they should learn algebra? Now, uh, geometry, he turns to geometry and he says geometry is knowledge of what always is. He argues that geometry draws the soul toward truth and produces philosophical thought by directing upwards what we wrongly direct downwards. Uh, the inscription above the door of Plato's Academy in Athens, again as the founder of the Western philosophical tradition, uh, it, that inscription is indicative of his estimation for geometry. It said, let none but geometers enter here. In other words, what he's getting at is when you study geometry, you study shapes, perfect triangles, circles, cubes, okay, etc. You're able to um, abstract from the reality in which we live, in which there really are no perfect circles or no perfectly equilateral triangles. They don't exist, actually. Okay? We've never touched one or drawn one or seen one, but nevertheless, we mentally can understand it. Okay? So what it, does, what it does is it enables us to see these eternal shapes and patterns, truths that are true no matter whether we draw them well or not, whether we imitate them or not. And he says that helps us to understand the nature of reality uh, in an important way. Astronomy. Plato praises astronomy because it compels the soul to look upward and leads it from things here to things there. And then finally, harmonics, or, or what we would call music. Plato claims that the study of harmonics is useful in the search for the beautiful and the good, but pursued for any other purpose, it's useless. And think about that. The reason why we study music, the reason why we learn to play music, is because it's part of our search as human beings for the nature of the beautiful and the good. It's not for entertainment. It's not to make us feel good or give us a beat to dance to. It's because ultimately, Plato says, it helps us to understand beauty and goodness. And that's part of what it means to be a human being and live a virtuous life. Okay, so note that while he understands that the subjects are very are valuable, in practical ways as well. Knowing arithmetic does help you in the marketplace, for example. He, he recognizes that those disciplines do have ancillary practical value. His essential point, however, is that these practical benefits are not the primary reason why they should be studied. Their purpose is not simply to provide technical training, however practical they might be. They nevertheless have a much deeper function. In other words, the disciplines of the quadrivium lead us toward truth and enable us to make sense of the world and our place in it. And the same could be said, of course, of the other disciplines of the trivium. That's an important thing for us as, a human, as human beings to do. It's important for us to understand who we are and the world around us and how we should live in it. So for Plato, the principal question that must be asked of any educational proposal is not, how much does it cost or will it work practically? The question is, will it promote the moral formation of the students toward whom it's directed? Will it help them to live virtuously? That's the question. Now, before I stop talking about Plato and give you some quotes from other thinkers throughout history, I do want to talk a little bit about knowledge because obviously education has to do with uh, acquiring knowledge, right? We give tests in which we ask students to, uh, to show that they've learned certain, certain bits of knowledge that we have taught them. It's interesting that according to Plato, knowledge without virtue is worse than useless. It's pernicious 
And the goal of education is therefore not merely to impart knowledge, again, that's a part of it, but it, it, it's not merely to impart knowledge, but also to nurture in students the virtue and wisdom that they will need in order to use that knowledge for the good. Education is most fundamentally concerned with conduct, not with knowledge. And the problem with knowledge, says Plato, is you can use it for good or for ill. Even if you have great knowledge of the world, it still doesn't answer the fundamental question, what then should I do? How should I use this knowledge? In the Republic, for example, Socrates explains that the one who is most able to guard against disease is also most able to produce it unnoticed. And that the person who is clever at guarding money must also be clever at stealing it. Knowledge, in other words, is not intrinsically good. For without a moral compass to guide its use, it can bring about great evil. Thus David Hicks writes that where knowledge grows without wisdom and without reverence, it threatens both our humanity and our world. So think about the fact, for example, that the same knowledge of construction and architecture that you need in order to build a cathedral could be used to build a gas chamber. The same knowledge. The question is not what do you know, but what virtue do you have that will enable you to use what you know for the good? The purpose of education is not just the assimilation of facts or the retention of information, but a habituation of the mind and the body to will and act in accordance with what we know. In the Euthydemus, Plato makes a similar point about supposed goods like wealth. He says, you know, what are things that people think are good? Well, money's good. Being healthy is good. Having good looks is a good. Okay? He says, look, unless any of those things is guided by wisdom, they are greater evils than their opposites. Y you are better off being poor and virtuous than wise. I'm sorry, let me say, say it again. You are better off being poor and virtuous than rich and corrupt. The rich person who's corrupt can do a lot more damage. In the Mino, Plato again claims that supposed goods like health, strength, beauty, and wealth can both benefit and harm us, and that whether they benefit or harm us depends on whether we use them rightly or wrongly. Think about all the harm that money can cause if it's misused. Think about all the harm that strength, just physical strength, can cause if it's misused. Think about all the harm that beauty can cause if it's misused. He's explicit that the acquisition of these supposed goods must not be taken to be the purpose of education. In the laws, he writes, a training directed to acquiring money or a robust physique or even to some intellectual facility not guided by reason and justice, we should want to call coarse and illiberal and say that it had no claim whatever to be called education. Okay, knowledge is not enough. Obviously, education is partially concerned with giving students knowledge. But according to Plato, that can't be the whole story. The purpose of education is intrinsically moral in nature. And the ultimate goal is to form students who are equipped with wisdom, with an understanding of the good, with a love for the good, such that they can use whatever knowledge they may possess in ways that are virtuous. So, those are a few of the key ideas of this incredibly important thinker, Plato, with regard to the purpose or telos of education. And in this last section, what I would like to do is turn away from Plato and now look at some other thinkers who have in many ways echoed his thought. Up until the end of the 19th century, so within the past 150 years or so, something akin to the Platonic view that I've just described has been the overwhelmingly dominant view of the purpose of education. The centrality of virtue in understanding education's purpose is not particular to Plato, nor to the Greeks, nor to the ancients. Rather, it has been a commonly accepted understanding of education that endured for millennia and was supplanted really only in the second half of the 19th century and then in some cases into the 20th century. 
I could trot out nearly endless examples uh, to demonstrate that this is the case, but I will restrict myself to a few that collectively offer a sort of inductive argument to demonstrate the point, okay, that, that these ideas I've been talking about from Plato are not, are not unique to him. Uh, throughout the history of education, many people have thought something very similar. So Plato's student Aristotle, another Greek philosopher, is highly critical of his fellow Greeks who fail to embrace a system of education with a view to all the virtues, but in a vulgar spirit, he writes, have fallen back on those which promised to be more useful and profitable. Okay? Uh, with regard to what subjects should be taught, Aristotle notes, occupations are divided into liberal and illiberal, and to young children should be imparted only such kinds of knowledge as will be useful to them without making mechanics of them. And any occupation, art or science, which makes the body or soul or mind of the free man less fit for the practice or exercise of virtue is mechanical. Wherefore, we call those arts mechanical which tend to deform the body, and likewise all paid employments, for they absorb and degrade the mind. The object also which a man sets before him makes a great difference. L listen to this last part. If he does or learns anything for his own sake or for the sake of his friends, or with a view to virtue, the action will not appear illiberal. So note that what Aristotle is saying here is not that learning mechanical arts is necessarily worthless. It, what he's saying is that the reason for which something is learned is of the utmost importance in determining its value. Learning carpentry or engineering or economics can be worthwhile provided that it is learned with a view to virtue and not, as we just saw, with a view toward what is useful or profitable. The Roman philosopher and orator Cicero similarly writes, when to an excellent and admirable natural disposition there is added a certain system and training of education, then from that combination arises an extraordinary perfection of character, such as is seen in that godlike man whom our fathers saw in their time, Africanus, and in Caius Laelius and Lucius Furius, most virtuous and moderate of men, and in that most excellent man, the most learned man of his time, Marcus Cato the Elder. And all these men, if they had been to derive no assistance from literature in the cultivation and practice of virtue, would never have applied themselves to the study of it. What, what Cicero is arguing, in other words, is that all these great heroes of Rome, these great men, understood that the purpose of studying literature is to cultivate a life of virtue. He says if they wouldn't have thought that that's what they were going to get from it, that it would have developed virtue in them, would have helped them to live more virtuously, they never would have studied it, of course. Why would you study something if it's not going to lead you to be a more virtuous person? The 14th and 15th century Italian Renaissance educational thinker, Petrus Paulus Verherdius, wrote in 1404, We call those studies liberal, which are worthy of a free man. Those studies by which we attain and practice virtue and wisdom. Starting to see a theme here? That education which calls forth, trains, and develops those highest gifts of body and mind which ennoble men and which are rightly judged to rank next in dignity to virtue only. A couple hundred years later, in 1643, the founders of Harvard College wrote a pamphlet in which they expressed the mission of Harvard College thus, Let every student be plainly instructed and earnestly pressed to consider well that the main end of his life and studies is to know God and Jesus Christ, which is eternal life, and therefore to lay Christ in the bottom as the only foundation of all sound knowledge and learning. Like Plato and these other thinkers, the founders of Harvard recognized that education is a fundamentally teleological activity. It's directed towards something, and the end toward which it is directed is one of an intrinsically moral nature. The 17th century British philosopher John Locke writes in his 1693 book, Some Thoughts, on, some thoughts Concerning Education, I'll say that again, 
The 17th century British philosopher John Locke writes in his 1693 book, Some Thoughts Concerning Education, that what all parents desire for their children, assuming they take any care of their education at all, he says, is contained, I suppose, in these four things, virtue, wisdom, breeding, and learning. I place virtue as the first and most necessary of those endowments that belong to a man or a gentleman, as absolutely requisite to make him valued and beloved by others, acceptable or tolerable to himself. Without that, I think, he will be happy neither in this nor in the other world. A couple more quotes uh, coming across the pond to, to the United States. Founding Father Benjamin Franklin writes in a 1750 letter to Samuel Johnson, I think with you that nothing is of more importance for the public weal than to form and train up youth in wisdom and virtue. Wise and good men are, in my opinion, the strength of a state, more so than riches or arms. Think about that. It is better for our country to have wise and good citizens than to be strong and have wealth and military power. So education, according to Benjamin Franklin, is essential for the well-being of our society, but not because it trains workers or equips us to outmanufacture other countries. Rather, education is essential insofar as it forms students into wise and virtuous beings. As Tracy Lee Simmons writes in Climbing Parnassus, the healthy society begins with healthy souls, and the healthiest souls are not formed without intellectual and most of all, spiritual labor. In 1787, the famous Northwest Ordinance uh, was written in which the government gave its official support for the development of schools. The Northwest Ordinance states, religion, morality, and knowledge being necessary to good government and the happiness of mankind, schools and the means of education shall forever be encouraged. Here again, the underlying assumption is that education is not merely about the acquisition of knowledge, but also about the religious and moral formation of human beings. The famous African-American thinker and activist W.E.B. Du Bois writes of education in 1903 this, If we make money the object of man training, we shall develop money makers, but not necessarily men. If we make technical skill the object of education, we may possess artisans, but not in nature men. Men we shall have only as we make manhood the object of the work of the schools. Intelligence, broad sympathy, knowledge of the world that was and is, and of the relation of men to it. This is the curriculum of that higher education which must underlie true life. And he goes on to declare, I insist that the object of all true education is not to make men carpenters. It is to make carpenters men. Education must not simply teach work. It must teach life. Again, the point is that if we just teach students to do a certain job in society, we've not necessarily helped them to live well. But if we teach them how to live well, then they'll be able to do that whether they end up as carpenters or teachers or architects or go on down the line, whatever career they go into. Education is not just career preparation. It is to make people in whatever career they choose into virtuous human beings, human beings who are able to live well. The famous 20th century British mathematician and philosopher Alfred North Whitehead claims in a 1929 essay technical education and its relation to science and literature, that the art of education is never easy. It is the training of souls. And finally, Arthur Holmes, another prominent philosopher of the 20th century, wrote in 1975, the question to ask about an education is not, what can I do with it? But rather, what is it doing to me as a person? Education has to do with the making of persons. Now, I could go on giving examples like this all day long. And the point I want to make is that the centrality of virtue in Plato's understanding of education is not a historical anomaly. 
In contemporary society, many people are trying to make education into something that supposedly is value neutral. But almost no educational thinker throughout history would have agreed that that's a good idea or even possible. Classical schools are thus not weird experiments, but rather a continuation of an educational legacy that stretches back for over two millennia and arguably even much further back if you go back into the Hebrew tradition. Throughout history, education has almost never been thought to be a wholly secular enterprise, but rather one that is intimately connected with the development of morality and virtue in students. The contemporary charade of value and virtue-free education is thus not only a philosophical and practical absurdity, but also demonstrates an asinine refusal to accept the nearly universal recognition of the importance of moral training that has existed throughout the history of education. Uh, that's the fancy of way of saying it's just plain dumb. Okay, so I'll say that once more as we close. The contemporary charade of value and virtue-free education is not only a philosophical and practical absurdity, but it also demonstrates an asinine refusal to accept the nearly universal recognition of the importance of moral training that has existed throughout the history of education. The cultivation of virtue has been absolutely central in the understanding of education's telos, or purpose, for thousands of years. And it should be in our own understanding of education as well. Thank you.